um, she's a qualified dentist who has worked in the dental industry for over 20 years. She has had a range of involvement in different public and private sector markets from small family-owned practices to large corporate chains, from local cooperatives to international institutions. She's also spent 10 years starting up and building her own dental establishment into a profitable enterprise in the private sector and successfully sold it in 2017. As a result, she has extensive experience in varied um, business environments. Victoria has um, also earned an MBA from the University of Nottingham and is interested in the world of commerce and economics, including new payment methods and the ways, uh, the ways in which uh, these will influence and profoundly affect our future. Um, her, her familiarization with Bitcoin came in 2016 when she uh, introduced Bitcoin as a payment method into her own business. Victoria now works as a Bitcoin advocate, supporting individuals and businesses that are similarly interested in adopting Bitcoin as a payment method. Um, and you can learn more about her and her work at, um, at, the, uh, at the website link, which I have provided in the learning room. So uh, if, you, if you guys are interested in what she's doing, you can go and visit her page. Uh, without much ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Victoria. Victoria, you have the floor or the screen. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm sorry I can't see your faces or even hear you. It feels very bizarre talking to you when I've got no way engaging with you directly. Um, but, um, you know, I'm very pleased to have been invited to speak to you today. Um, and what I've been asked to talk about is Bitcoin, the technology fundamentals and a value analysis. Now, I've just been talking to Jeremy a little bit, and he was talking a little bit about trading and, you know, how to open accounts and things like that. I've not really focused my talk on that um, today. Um, the brief I was given was very broad, and there are a lot of ways in which you can approach the topic of Bitcoin. So what I've tried to do today is give you a bit of a flavor of how um, the technology actually works, um, why people see it as a form of money, you know, how that fits in with our current financial system and, you know, to round up, you know, some ideas about where the price might be going in the future um, and also, you know, how it might work as a disruptive technology. So I hope um, that that's helpful to you all. Um, I understand that some of you know very little about Bitcoin. Some of you might all also be already trading Bitcoin. So I'm hoping that what I've done um, has at least given everybody who's listening, they'll get something out of it. And um, by all means, you know, I'd, be, I'd welcome your feedback at the end. So I've titled this, this talk, uh, Bitcoin, the Technology Fundamentals and Value Analysis. Um, and it's been prepared specifically for you, the Nottingham University postgraduate students. Um, so what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to do a short introduction, tell you a little bit about myself, just to clarify some of the biodata that Jeremy's already given you. Um, I'm going to tell you about how I know specifically about Bitcoin, talk to you a little bit why I feel like I, I, I'm qualified to talk to you about it. Um, I'm then going to go through how Bitcoin works, um, why I think it's useful as a form of money, why you might want to use it as a payment method, why businesses might use it as a payment method. Um, we're going to look at some price analysis for the future. Then I'm going to round up with a summary, some of my contact information. And then to close, um, I've allowed 15 minutes for questions at the end, although Jeremy's very kindly said, you know, if, if you want to carry on the conversation a little bit longer, I'm able to hang around to do so. So we'll see how it goes. OK, um, I'm not going to be able to stop and answer questions as I go through the talk because it might disrupt the flow. But if anything occurs to you while I'm talking, by all means, please write it down and bring it up at the end. It may well be that later on in the presentation I cover your question or if I don't at all, I'd be more than happy to talk about it at the end. OK, so to begin with the introdu introduction, um, my name is Victoria Colette Jones. I include my middle name because Victoria Jones is actually quite a common name, so it's just a way of distinguishing me from other people. Um, I'm a fully qualified dentist. I spent 10 years working for other people in all sorts of different organisations. And even though I qualified as a dentist, I was always a bit ambivalent about actually practising as a dentist, but I was always very interested in how... I was always very interested in how... Um, the healthcare profession worked. I was always interested in it from more of a macro perspective. And so um, in my mid-20s, I decided to study for an MBA just to kind of develop those ideas um, a little bit more. 
And then after I'd done that, I decided it was time to put some of that learning into practice. So I opened my own business from scratch. Um, I didn't buy a business. I started it right from the very beginning and I built it up over 10 years before until I felt like I'd learned everything that I needed to know. And then I sold it because I wanted to do move on to do something else. During the latter part of the time running that business, that was when I started to get interested in Bitcoin and I actually started offering it as a payment method to my clients and I found the technology and what was behind it so fascinating, I decided that this is what I wanted to dedicate my time to going forward. So in order to um, talk about that, that a bit for bit further, you know, how I got involved in Bitcoin, um, you know, what I start. It came about because I was starting to investigate better storage options for my savings. The first few years of running my business were very difficult financially, especially as they coincided with um, the financial crisis of 2008. So when I was finally starting to make a profit, I wanted to find better ways of storing my money because um, the banks were only offering very low percentage interest rates, 0.001%. Um, and I remembered from my childhood, you know, being able to go to the post office and get getting 10% on my savings. So I didn't really understand what had happened and I really wanted to make sure I made the best choices for the future. So that's when I started looking into this a little bit more. So, you know, that led me to learning about what sound money was and gold and silver. And so I bought a little bit of gold and silver in 2016 because I decided that, you know, rather than having it in the bank, maybe it would be safer, you know, having what's known as hard sound money. Um, you know, at home, not all of it, of course, but, you know, it felt like that was a sensible thing to do. But in the process of running a business, I realised that even though gold and silver were a form of hard money, it wasn't really very practical as a business owner, you know, wanting, I really did not like the idea of collecting gold and silver coins from my customers. So although I understood the philosophy behind gold and silver as hard money, I realised that, um, you know, if for mod for the modern society, we'd need a digital solution going forward. And so that's when I started to investigate Bitcoin. And by the beginning of 2017, I was offering Bitcoin as a payment option to my clients. I eventually sold my business in 2017 and then um, completed my associate dental contract in 2018. So I stopped working um, full time as a dentist in 2018. And then after that, I spent a couple of years um, investigating Bitcoin a bit more and I attended a number of conferences that I've listed here for you to see and by the sixth and seventh conference I was starting to work as a speaker. I, I was starting to gain so much information and I was so interested in it that I was starting to speak and, and share my knowledge and those two those two uh, talks are now, now on my website and on my uh, YouTube channel if anyone decides they'd like to see them at a later date. So that's how I got interested and that's how, you know, I spent my time learning about it. And after I'd gathered all of this information, I then decided to put it in a book. And so I published my first book um, called Truth Decay, How Bitcoin Fixes This. And this was published in March last year, 2020, just as the pandemic hit. Um, and, uh, and I'm very pleased. Early in the year, by chance, I discovered that... Um, there's a website called Book Authority that um, tries to list the world's best books. And um, for a while, I was number four on their best new Bitcoin books. And I'm currently featured in their best 100 Bitcoin books of all time. So I'm very quite chuffed with that acc accolade. came out of nowhere, but I was very pleased when I discovered that that's what had happened. So um, and so that's now um, available for people to read if they want to. So Bitcoin in 2020. 2021, what is all the fuss about? I'll just wait for that to come up on your screens. So obviously this is, you know, Bitcoin goes through phases where people forget about it and they think it's dead and then all of a sudden it rises from the ashes and everybody's talking about it. And Bitcoin's a bit like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. So we're going to start off the discussion with the people who hate it. Talk a little bit about the people who hate it. So I've got three characters here we're going to talk about. The first one is Peter Schiff. Um, some of you may or may not know who he is. So he is he manages um, an investment company called Euro Pacific Capital um, based in the US. And he is very famous for calling Bitcoin be Beanie Babies. He's a very famous gold bug. He he's very keen on gold as a form of money, um, but he doesn't buy into Bitcoin at all. He calls it Beanie Babies. 
We've also got Warren Buffett, a uh, very famous uh, hedge fund manager, um, runs a fund known for Berkshire Hathaway, and he's famous for calling Bitcoin rat poison squared. And then we also have Andrew Bailey, who's the governor of our Bank of, Bank of England, and he is famous for saying, be prepared to lose all your money if you invest in Bitcoin. So very helpful. Anyone who listened to those guys would not be touching Bitcoin with a barge pole. Um, and fair enough. But one of the things I found find interesting about these three characters and other people who fall into the same category is they all seem to work for financial institutions. So we've got Euro Pacific Capital, Berkshire Hathaway and the Bank of England. And um, I think this category will become interesting as the talk goes along and you'll be able to see, you know, why I think that and the contrast. Because now, if we start to look at the people who are very keen on Bitcoin, they fall into a whole different category altogether. So the first one is Michael Saylor. So he, Michael Saylor is the CEO of MicroStrategy and he freely admits that Feb February last year, he, had, he didn't really have much of a clue as to what Bitcoin actually is. Um, but uh, as soon as the pandemic happened and a number of interesting things started happening in the uh, financial markets, he was inclined to take a closer look. And it's quite funny, as soon as it, he, it became well known that he was interested in Bitcoin, a lot of people went through his old Twitter feeds and found out that in 2013, he was actually saying some quite negative things. But clearly, in 2020, he changed his mind because he first bought 21,454 Bitcoins for the company balance sheet in August last year. Um, and uh, is now... Uh, forging ahead with converting uh, most of the balance sheet of his company into Bitcoin because by the 1st of March, they had acquired 90,859 Bitcoins and had spent 2.1 billion on them. And one of his famous quotes is that holding cash on a balance sheet is like handling a rapidly melting ice cube. Um, so I think that's a pretty good quote. Um, he's also famous for engaging with Elon Musk on Twitter um, and uh, telling him that he needs to put some cash in his balance sheet. And it would appear Elon Musk took some notice uh, because he bought 1.5 billion in Bitcoin on the 8th of February 2021. Um, and also they're now accepting Bitcoin as a payment for Tesla cars in the US. And they plan on holding Bitcoin that they take as payment on their balance sheet. They have no plans to convert it back to cash which is very interesting. In the early days of Bitcoin, you may have heard, you know, there are var various payment uh, channels that would try and would allow a business to accept payment in Bitcoin, but they'd try and convert it to cash straight away. So this is the first time, um, you know, someone really prominent has, you know, made the commitment to actually keep the Bitcoin on their balance sheet rather than sell it again straight away. So that's a very significant development. And then right now we've got Sotheby's, the auction house. They're about to auction a Banksy painting called Love is in the Air. Uh, the auction is to take place on the 12th of May, 2021. And um, they have said they will accept Bitcoin and Ethereum as a payment method. So where do we begin talking about Bitcoin? And I think a good place to start is by thinking about what is money. Now, um, you can get very confused when you start to think about money because just in the process of finding a definition, you come up with all sorts of words. You've got store of value, means of exchange, unit of account, commodity money, fiat money, fiduciary money, commercial bank money. And then you've got their feature, their characteristics, fungible, divisible, portable, durable, uniform, limited in supply and acceptable. Um, all of which can get very confusing. But the uh, quote, the definition that I like best is by someone called Murray N. Rothbart, who has written a book called What Has Government Done to Our Money? And his definition is of money is the cumulative development of a medium of exchange on the free market. OK, so um, we're starting to see that the different ideas behind money um, is influenced in, in many different ways and finding the words to describe it just in and of itself is very difficult. But Murray has developed this, Murray developed this definition as a result of studying forms of money in history. And so you've got shells that were um, used by some remote Caribbean um, communities as a form of money. Uh, you know, Roman soldiers were known to exchange salt as a form of money. And of course, we've got the metals, gold and silver, um, which people are more familiar with um, as operating, 
operating as a form of money. And in fact, gold um, is considered to have been the best form of money for the last 5,000 years. Um, uh, whenever there's financial problems, often people will end up going back to gold and we'll explore that a little bit more further. Um, so these were forms of money that could be used directly in exchange, but there are other forms of money as well. Um, and one of the examples that people often like to talk about in the Bitcoin community is the Yappies stone money. So this this is very interesting. And I was actually fortunate enough as part of my um, dental training, I actually had to do an elective in a foreign country. And I ended up in Yap, bizarrely enough, uh, 20 years before, um, if I'd known 20 years ago what I was doing now, I'd have taken some better quality pictures. But these were actually photographs that were taken at the time. So this was me um, around 23 years old, just outside um, the Yappies airport. Um, and on the left here, you can see, you know, rows of houses with stone monies outside of the house. This was very strange, you know, when I was in my 20s walking around this island, I could and people told me that this represented their money. I, you know, I was like, well, what's all that about? And it turns out what used to happen is because these stone monies were very heavy, um, they would be placed in a certain location on the island where they couldn't be moved, usually outside somebody's houses. And the, the stones weren't actually moved when they wanted to make a transaction with someone. There was a ledger that actually kept a record of the transaction that someone was kept. And it was recorded um, against what the stone money was meant to represent. And actually, the system worked extremely well for many years. In fact, even when they were transporting one of the stone monies and it got lost below the sea, it was still included on the ledger because they knew where it was. And also the advantage of having the stone money is visible to everybody is it meant the community could see for themselves that this is where the money was. And so that's what helped to keep the ledger honest. So, you know, so from ancient times, there have um, been um, different forms of money. But essentially, you know, when it comes to money, it's it's a technology that's used in order to help um, human beings make exchanges with each other and exchange value. Um, so, you know, if Eva wants to pay Ben, um, in the olden days, she might have given him some gold coins and this would be the transaction. Um, but if you're doing it with Bitcoin, you know, how do you actually receive the transaction? You're not holding the coins, um, you know, it, it, you're not holding them physically. Um, what tends to happen with a Bitcoin payment is you'll normally use an app on your phone. You know, Bitcoin is a software protocol. And so this is an example of how I was accepting the Bitcoin payments in 2017. You know, I just had an old iPhone. I downloaded an app on the phone. And this phone was just used for that purpose. And all I had to do was when I needed to needed my nurses to charge the patient, they'd enter the amount. And the app would automatically calculate how much Bitcoin that was worth. And then we would accept the payment. So that's just a demonstration of, you know, how, how you would receive it. So if we go back to Eva and Ben, if Ben wants to receive Bitcoin, what he's going to do, you can see there's a row of letters and numbers there. That's actually his Bitcoin wallet, his public wallet address. Um, and that can be converted into a QR code, which makes it easy to scan. So what Eva needs to do is scan that QR code and it will mean that she can send any Bitcoin that she has um, into Ben's uh, public wallet, and that is how they create the transaction. Now, Eva obviously wants to make sure that um, her funds are kept secured, so um, she might have an app on her phone, similar to the one that um, I, that is used to receive the payment, or she might store them safely in what's known as a hardware wallet, and this is just a picture on the left, that white device is an, is an example of the hardware wallet. Um, and that hardware wallet or even the wallet that's on her phone will have a private key, which is what will be used to unlock the transaction so that she can pay Ben. Um, and the software developers have been very clever and they've actually enabled this key to be coded um, using some straightforward English words that are actually um, it's possible to remember in your head. So even if you lose the device, it's possible if you remember these words to actually recover your funds. Very clever. So Eva's able to keep her funds safe. And when she wants to make a transaction to Ben, um, she unlocks her wallet um, and scans uh, Ben's QR code. And that's how the transaction is completed. So again, here's an example of some different hardware wallets. You've got the Trezor wallet and the Ledger wallet. And you can just see how these plug into the computer. And this helps to keep 
the private key separate from the computer. So the computer, you know, even though there's some hacking software that can that can record screens, the private key is always kept separate from the device and it's just an extra level of security. Um, so this is an example of what the hardware wallet looks like when you open it, um, if no one's ever seen that before. So you plug the device into the computer and it brings up a screen like this. And you can see where the address is, that's where you enter the code, the letters and numbers that uh, ben was presenting on his software code. If, you, if you're not able to scan the QR code, you can just enter it as a list of um, letters and numbers there. You can enter the amount of uh, BTC. It will give you um, the conversion. And then, you know, when you're sending a Bitcoin transaction, rather than with, norm with the money we used to, um, they normally the shop owners will have to pay a fee to accept the payment with bitcoin it's the person who's sending the transaction who has to send the fee and the the, the cost of the fee is normally dependent on how busy the network is and so um the wallet will often give you um an opportunity to set the fee depending on how fast you want the transaction to be so for example if you're going to pay in a shop you might want the transaction to be quite fast so that you can leave quickly but if it's over the internet for something that's not going to be delivered straight away then it probably doesn't matter if the if it's a few hours before before the payment is confirmed so that's an example of how it works in real life for anyone who hasn't seen that before so the transaction is one thing, but how do we make sure that, um, you know, it's recorded like those, like um, with the Yappies stones? And how do we make sure the community can make sure that all of the transactions are kept honest? And the way in which this works is that um, a computer obviously is keeping a record of the transaction that Eva has made to Ben. Um and what it's doing is it's not just um, monitoring that, recording their transaction, but it's recording all of the other transactions that are also occur occurring in the vicinity that are Bitcoin transactions. Um, and not only that, every there are computers all around the world that are set up as Bitcoin nodes that are keeping track of exactly the same transaction simultaneously. And all of these nodes um, are keeping track of what's going on. We even have a satellite in space now that's operating as a Bitcoin node and all of them are keeping track of all of these transactions. Not only that, they're all communicating with each other in order to make sure that they're keeping their records, um, keeping their records equally. And that's what's known as consensus. The fact that all of these, these computers are keeping the same record um, of all of the transactions is what helps to keep um, the transactions honest. So um, recording the transactions is one thing, but how do we make sure that those transactions aren't repeated or they stay unique? Well, this is where blockchain comes in. And I've done this animation here to try and explain to you how this works. So the construction of the blockchain. So we've got these computers collecting all of these transactions. You can see them coming in here. The nodes keeping a record of them. Um, so these are all coming into the computer and at the same time the node is letting all of the other nodes know about these transactions as well. Um, but in order to make sure that these transactions have been validated, we need the assistance of a miner. So this is where Bitcoin mining comes in. So what the miner does is when a block of, when a block of transactions has been um, created, so each block has a certain amount of data that it can take when that block is full what the miners are doing is they're working out a very complex math maths puzzle in order to find a solution and there are only ever going to be 21 million solutions for these um, maths problems and when they discover the answer to, to one it's attached to the block and this is known as the proof of work okay and the miners get a reward for that proof of work because it's confirming all of these transactions. So this proof of work is attached to that block, the transactions are confirmed, and as a reward, that's how Bitcoins are created. Now at the moment, um, the reward for confirming a block of transactions is 6.25 Bitcoins, but that reward actually halves every four years. So four years ago, um, the reward was 12.5 Bitcoins, and then four years before that, it was 25 Bitcoins. So the amount, the reward um, reduces every four years. And that has an influence on the price of Bitcoin, which we'll get to a little bit later. 
But following on from this, so this first block of transaction has been confirmed. That confirmed block then moves up. A new set of transaction comes in. We get another proof of work. We get another confirmation. And so that means the first set of transactions has now had two confirmations, the first one and now the second one. And then we do the same thing. The tra transactions move up. Another block needs to be confirmed. That's then confirmed. And the first set of transactions has now had three confirmations. And so this is how the blockchain is created. You've got block one that's then connected to block two, that's then connected to block three. Um, and so the whole time, you know, all of these transactions have now been confirmed. Anyone who's made that transaction can be confident um, that that's now been verified and can't be repeated. And the nodes are keeping track of everything that's happened as well. OK, and it continues like this. So um, the nodes continue to collect transactions and they're collected by the block. They're collected onto the blockchain and the blockchain is built as the miners actually confirm the transactions as they're going through. OK, so so this is what makes Bitcoin unique, because up until Bitcoin was invented, um, even though uh, software could be copied, it was very easy for software to be copied. There was no way of actually making software that was unique. And this was known as the Byzantine generals problem. So the idea is, you know, if the general was in the battle, in order to make sure that his instruction was being received clearly and it wasn't being corrupted, um, it was really difficult to make that happen. And so this was known in um, computer software. And we've got a definition here where it says the Byzantine general's problem is a term etched from the computer science description of a situation where involved parties must agree on a single strategy in order to avoid complete failure, but where some of the involved parties are corrupt and disseminating false information or are otherwise unreliable. So Bitcoin solved that problem. It's, create, it's managed to create software that's unique and by having a number of different actors involved in confirming the blockchain and having certain rewards programmed into its software, um, you know, all of that together creates a really unique product. And this is what makes Bitcoin so special. Because by solving the Byzantine General's problem, we now have a monetary solution that operates as a machine of trust. Now, why should we need that? Surely we've already got a machine of trust. You know, our banks are trustworthy, our governments are trustworthy, um, everything around us is trustworthy, surely. Um, but actually, if you go back and look at the history of money, that's not the case at all. So we were talking earlier about how gold has been um, a form of money for thousands of years. And for 100 years between 1815 and 1914, you know, this is how money operated throughout most of the world. Although different countries had different currencies, they were all tied to a certain amount of gold. Now, with the advent of the First World War, because that adventure was so expensive and, and everybody had a vested interest in winning it, um, the only way they could continue to meet the cost, because it became very expensive, um, was to temporarily suspend um, how much gold could be um, redeemed by the banknotes and all of the countries did this and so what it meant was after the first world war not only did they have the devastation of war to deal with but they also had to deal with the problems with the currencies and i don't know if any anyone's familiar with the weimar uh, hyperinflation but this happened towards the end um end of the teens of, of the 1917 18 uh, 18 19 20 and then the early 20s you know this is when that whole drama happened because, um, you know, uh, Germany had been Germany had been um, indebted with a lot of costs from the war, which was part of the problem. But another part of the problem was that, um, you know, a lot of these currencies had had uh, divorced themselves from the original gold standard. And although they tried to revalue their currencies to get back onto the gold standard, they didn't do it accurately, which just created more problems. So eventually they came up with a gold exchange standard, which was between Britain and the United States between 1960, 1926 and 1931. And of course, everyone um, is familiar uh, with the great uh, stock market crash that happened around 1929. And this, the breakdown of this 
um, gold exchange standard may well have had something to do with it. And so they were back to fluctuating fiat currencies. And of course, this coincided with the Great Depression between 1931 and 1945. And a big part of the problem was that, um, you know, the money had lost its attachment to gold and all of that had to be uh, reconfigured. So eventually after the Second World War, they set up Bretton Woods where they came to an arrangement that all of the currencies would be tied to a new gold exchange standard that would be uh, held by the United States because the United States, because they were late to the war, they were one of the few countries that hadn't exhausted all of their resources fighting the war um, and so they were in a position to manage this so they got the job um, but you know as soon as you give someone that kind of power and responsibility inevitably it's going to go wrong and so that started to unravel between 1968 and 1971 where we got the Nixon stat uh, the the gold shock where Nixon took the United States off the gold standard which was um, really quite something so you had the end of Bretton Woods, back to fluctuating fiat currencies for a while. Um, then they came up with um, another agreement, but that didn't work. That broke down. And then there was another agreement. By the end of the 1970s, uh, America came to an agreement with um, the Arabian countries um, to only, only for them to only sell their uh, petrol or their oil for dollars. And so this is where the phrase the petrodollar comes from and of course you know this even though the fiat currencies were fluctuating this helped to um, sustain um, America's power even though it come off the gold standard um, but of course you know money was no longer gold but in the process of all of these things breaking down um, you know debt started to become another form of money and when we had the financial crisis in 2008 of course we were introduced to this new term quantitative easing which allowed to create more banks to keep uh, more uh, currency to be created in order to help keep some of the central institutions afloat even though they were struggling behind the scenes. Um, and you can see here we've got a graph of what that looks like in nominal terms. So you can see, you know, the red really starts to increase around 19, 1970 um, and then really starts to take off um, around 1980. Um, and this is just in the US, of course. So remember, by now, the US is kind of holding the currency standard for most of the world, first through um, the Bretton Woods Agreement. Then Nixon came off the gold standards, and then it became the petrodollar. So behind the scenes, this is the amount of debt that's being created. And um, as of the 3rd of May 2016, so exactly five years ago, the US national debt stood at 19 trillion. Um, but five years later, it now stands at... 28 trillion. So that's so the US national debt is now increasing at a rate of almost 2 trillion a year. And if you look at the graph, you'll see I've just extended it just so you can see how it's now extending beyond the top of the graph. That's the rate of increase of, of the debt. Now, when people start talking about trillions, it's really difficult to visualize that amount of money. I mean, billion, trillion, you know, it, it, it becomes incomprehensible. So I found some animation on YouTube, uh, where it just kind of shows you, you know, what money looks like. This is a million dollars in um, hundred dollar notes. Then we've got a billion dollars in a hundred dollar notes. And then the jump from a billion to a trillion is actually absolutely huge. A trillion dollars actually requires pallets of billion dollar, billion dollars, uh, which would fill an airport runway. Um, and then if you actually visualize this in terms of, um, you know, skyscrapers compared to the Statue of Liberty, you know, you've also got 20 skyscrapers of $100 banknotes. Um, and this is giving you an idea of what 20 trillion looks like. And this was the amount of debt the US was in in 2017. So just four years ago, and it's now 28 trillion. That's almost a rate of two trillion a year. But that's not just the US. I mean, US around the world, you know, world debt um, is now estimated to be about 300 trillion. So it's just phenomenal. Um, so, you know, and so what's the problem with this? So the problem with this is inflation. If, and if any of you are actually aware of what's being discussed in the financial news channels at the moment, you know, inflation is a big um, topic of discussion right now. So what is inflation? So in, in economics, um, in, 
well, the, there are a number of ways in which you can define it, but this particular definition um, defines it as a persistent substantial rise in the general level of prices related to an increase in the volume of money, volume of money and resulting in the loss of value of currency as opposed to deflation. Now, obviously, we can see from the animation I've just shown you that the increase in the volume of money, there's no question about that. But people argue that actually inflation is not that bad and they measure inflation by using what's called a, a basket of currencies in the CPI in order to show that inflation is, isn't that bad. Um, so they will argue, So a lot of the uh, financial pundits will argue that um, they want inflation at a rate of 2% a year. Um, but really, if you're if you're operating with um, an even means of exchange, it shouldn't even be 2% a year. You know, you want the value of what you're exchanging with to, um, to maintain its value. So they use the CPI to measure prices in order to uh, see whether or not inflation is happening or not. But actually, inflation can happen in a number of other insidious ways. It can, it's not just about increase in prices, but the price of something might stay about the same, but its quantity might decrease um, or its quality might decrease, which is what is often happening with a number of services if you're looking around. And although People argue that there's not much inflation in the economy because some of our everyday goods aren't increasing in price that much. There are other things that definitely are increasing in price. And so here, I'll just wait for the slide to come up. We've got a chart of UK house prices. And, you know, interestingly, we can see how the price of houses in the UK has absolutely taken off since 1970. Um, and interestingly, it tends to mirror the shape of um, the amount of debt in the US. So, you know, house prices probably are reflecting what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but if we compare it to something like gold that we were talking to talking about earlier, you know, interestingly, so this is these are house prices priced in gold. So you can see there was a big hump between 2000 and 2010, but then it's kind of leveled off again in terms of price. But if we look at actually what the gold price has done, in contrast, you can see it's kind of started to take off towards the end. Um, so I've put some lines in to try and compare the timeline. So you can see in the run up to 2000, the house price was starting to take off, but um, the price of gold was fairly level. Um, and then 2010, as the as um, house prices in terms of gold were dropping, you can see that actually by then the price of gold was really starting to take off. So, you know, if you're not aware of these things, what it means is that on an everyday basis, it's really difficult to know, you know, how money is actually being valued. You need you need a lot of reference points in order to be able to navigate, you know, how the financial system is actually working right now, um, which is a really tricky thing to do. The other way in which most people measure it is, you know, how a house price is being valued compared to earnings. Um, and you can see since 1845, um, it's actually been getting, it was actually getting cheaper to buy a house up until, um, you know, the mid, well, up until the First World War, actually. And then after the First World War, there was a leap in house prices again, but they were pretty much level until about 1992, apart from the occasional blip. But from about the mid-90s, um, house prices, particularly compared to wages, really started to increase. So that was the point at which the everyday person was really starting to notice it. So again, you know, you use this metric and, you know, it's understanding how, how all of these things are valued in relationship to each other makes it really difficult for the average person to know how to, um, you know, manage things and manage their finances or the average business. And here we have um, a chart which is just showing, you know, what's happened to all major currencies, what's happened to them since in the 1900s, um, you know, when we came off the gold standard or specifically since the First World War. So, you know, these days I see lots of adverts on YouTube for YouTube for currency traders and the three, two, one method. And, you know, this is why people can make money from trading currencies because they're all fluctuating against each other because they've lost, they've lost their grounding. There's nothing to compare them to again. So this is really, really tricky, you know, and if, if you're accepting a payment for yourself or if you're accepting a payment in a business, you know, not everything you need to spend that money on 
are you going to spend straight away? You know, some of it you might want to save because there are expenses you might have in the future. So, you know, if you're a young person, you might be thinking about what happens when you get old and you're not able to work anymore. If you're a business, you might be thinking about, you know, you might need to replace a piece of equipment in five years. So it's really, really important that you're able to hold on to, you know, some of your money that you can spend in the future. So if we go back, taking it back to Bitcoin, you know, if, we, if we're talking about that in terms of um, receiving a payment, you know, imagine that, you know, you'd met all your expenses and someone gave you this really nice pie, imagining that it had the potential of lasting, um, you know, for five years. Um, and you wanted to hold on to this. And at the time, you know, there was only one around and this was really precious. And, and you imagined that you'd be able to swap it for something better in the future. And so you put this away, your plan is to, you know, try to exchange it for something in five years. But in the space of that five years, someone gets hold of the idea, the fact that you want to exchange it for something more valuable in the future. And someone decides to start making pies. And before you know it, in the space of five years, you've got more pies than the eye can see. And in fact, someone comes along, makes a really big pie just to make the situation even worse. Um, so then what do you do? Whereas if someone had paid you instead in terms of a piece of a pie that was never actually going, that no one could ever actually duplicate, but as more people saw that it was valuable, it just grew bigger. What it means is a small piece of pie that you were paid with originally, as the pie gets bigger, is your piece of the pie gets bigger as well. And so this is an analogy of why Bitcoin's valuable because, you know, only 21 million Bitcoins are ever going to be created. You know, this proof of work number, it's been programmed so that only 21 uh, million um, Bitcoins will ever be released by the by the blockchain. And so as people come to value the network of Bitcoin uh, more and more, anyone who got a piece of the pie whilst it was still small um, find, dis tends to discover that that piece of pie becomes more valuable as time goes by and more people discover how valuable this new technology is. So hopefully that helps you to understand, you know, where the value that some people, this is why some people really uh, value Bitcoin, and maybe why someone like My Michael Saylor and Elon Musk are now keen to have it on their balance sheet, because as compared to the number of pies that can be infinitely created, once they own those Bitcoins, no one else can create them. And so that is actually something that's really valuable for them, in terms of their protecting the assets going forward in the future. So why would a business accept Bitcoin as a form of payment? And this is, you know, this is a tricky thing because there are a number of drawbacks. There are accounting drawbacks, legal drawbacks, you know, issues with tax, managing short term price volatility, um, the delay in payments. You know, if you're waiting for confirmations, you know, access to the Internet, if that's not working um, for any reason. And there's a huge learning curve with this new technology. However, you know, a lot of businesses and not just businesses, but also individuals, you know, there's a huge amount of risk because at the moment in our society, the only way in which um, you can manage your transactions is to need is to have access to a, a bank account. If you're a business, you need a card machine and they, you know, I can tell you from personal experience, they aren't always re reliable. There can also be problem with delayed payments, bank closures. You know, if you need a if you need a bank for a business loan and then the bank for some reason decides to call them in, you know, that's happened several times, can be absolutely devastating, you know, and there's no alternative um, for consumers. So just on a very basic level, you know, certainly running a business for myself, I started to learn, you know, I started to realise just how vulnerable I was if anything happened with the banks or anything happening with delayed payments or card machines, really, really tricky. So, um, so that was important. Um, but the main reason why they might be interested in it, and these are the people who are running businesses as opposed to people who are working for the financial institutions, for the businesses, it helps protect them against inflation. It helps, to, it helps them to keep prices stable for their customers. If they can rely on their savings, they're able to price their services more fairly. It helps to protect the value of their assets. It helps to manage costs. It enables fair payments for their staff. And it most importantly, it removes their reliance on the banks. So this is becoming a really appealing feature. OK, and also, you know, without a bank, it's just 
so easy to take a payment. So this, an exa this is an example from my website. So I've got a couple of Bitcoin buttons on my website, you know, one for uh, selling my book. And also from time to time, people will approach me for um, individual advice about Bitcoin. And, you know, I don't set up, I don't charge by the hour or anything. I just say, you know, if you want to um, say thank you and give me a donation, I've got a donation button there. So this video is just showing you what happens when you click this button. So this is clicking the the button um, for paying for the book and you can see it just brings up this QR code um, that someone can scan so you don't even need someone nearby you know someone in a completely different country could scan that QR code over the computer or copy the address um, and that enables um, the payment to be made um, and so with the donation button you can even you know just as, an, as a demonstration you can change you can change the value then click the button and what the software does is it automatically calculates, you know, what the Bitcoin the level of Bitcoin for the price that Bitcoin is at the moment and enables the payment to be made. And there we are. The payment's been confirmed. And then there's a button that can be clicked to uh, take you back to the website. So really, really clever. It's all automated. You don't need a bank and everything's set up for you. And this enables, you know, any kind of Internet business you know, to collect money in their sleep if they wanted to set it up that way. Um, and if you haven't have a, a lightning node, it can happen even faster. So the technology is developing in leaps and bounds and really, and really, um, you know, giving people many more choices than they've had in the future. So price predictions, I promised you at the beginning that we'd talk about that. So I've talked about the halvings where the block reward halves. And you can see here, this is just the example of a price chart and you can see how the halvings tend to happen um, towards the, well, just after the low in the price cycle. And the reason for that is because if the miners, if the miners realize there's, um, the you know, they're still mining the same number of blocks at the same kind of speed, but they know that coming up in the future, their reward is going to be halved. What happens is as the halving is coming up, they tend to hold back the Bitcoins because they, they need the bitcoins that they create in order to pay their electricity costs. So, moving up to a, to a halving, they will actually hold them back. And then after the halving, because the price has been going up, you know, a lot of traders see the price going up, and so there tends to be a bit of a frenzy. Um, and because there's a re reduction in the amount of supply of bitcoin, you know, the price tends to fluctuate like this, and it tends to do that for about. 18 months afterwards until it gets so high someone who's been holding them for a long time decides to sell and then you know we kind of get a dip in the price before the whole thing happens again and so people are starting to look at these price cycles and and analyzing them them in great depth and those of you who are already in bitcoin may already be familiar with um the stock to flow um and you know so this is a a mathematical model that's been set up by um, someone known as Plan B. His handle on Twitter is um, 100 trillion USD. And you can just see this pattern. He's kind of got this pattern that coincides with the halvings. And then he's kind of plotting the price trajectory against how that works and just demonstrating how we anticipate the price of Bitcoin is likely to um, proceed in the future. You've also got the rainbow chart, which kind of does a similar thing. So these are good ways of kind of seeing where the price might be going in terms of um, its trajectory and development on the network. It's also important to, to recognise that these charts are structured on a log scale rather than a nominal scale. So actually, um, the price rises are much more exponential um, if you actually see them in, in a nominal chart, but actually you wouldn't see the, the general slope if you if you just saw it in, in that perspective. Um, so things are certainly changing. Um, we've got some quotes here of things people have said in the past compared to what they're actually saying now. So um, JP Morgan is known for saying that Bitcoin is a fraud that will blow up, says JP Morgan. But now he's saying um, investors should make Bitcoin 1% of their portfolios. Goldman Sachs lists five reasons why Bitcoin is not an asset class nor a suitable investment, but is now saying uh, Goldman Sachs restarts cryptocurrency desk amid Bitcoin boom. And then we've got PayPal saying it's useless as a payment mechanism and ridiculous as a store of value. But they, they've now admitted that they're going to enter, the, enter crypto um, following a long build up in their expertise. Um, and then at the end of last year, there was this 
there was a website called bitcointreasuries.org that start, was starting to record, you know, how many companies were actually keeping um, Bitcoin on their balance sheets, because actually this is uh, information that's made publicly available. And you can see there are probably about 10 companies towards the end of last year. But um, earlier today, I checked, um, and it's now estimated that 1.4 million Bitcoins are held on the balance sheets of 56 companies worldwide, and that's at a current value of 79 billion. So that's the development that's occurred in just the last six months. So we could well be on the verge of something here. Um, and Bitcoin, you know, if Bitcoin takes over as a form of money, um, and it certainly has the potential to do so, although there are still things that need to be worked out, you know, that could have huge implications. Um, you know, in 2019, the financial services sector contributed $132 billion to the UK economy, 6.9% of which was 6.9% of total economic output. Um, you know, UK financial services is the ninth largest in the OECD um, in 2019. Um, and uh, market estimates believe that by 2022, the financial services market is expected to reach $26.5 trillion globally. But in contrast, the global market cap of all cryptocurrencies is currently $2.29 trillion, and Bitcoin is, is almost half of that at $1.03 trillion. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of scope, um, there's, there's a lot for Bitcoin to take over. And so this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, people have such high hopes for it in the future. And like I said earlier, you know, the moment you own a piece of that pie, the pie is only, as the pie gets bigger, that piece of the pie becomes more valuable. So software is about to eat the world of money and everything will change but that's another story. So that's, um, I think that's everything I plan to say for today. Um, if you'd like more information about me and what I do, my website is satoshispage.com. There's my logo um, and the photo on my website. Um, all my social media links are on there. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Um, I've also got a free newsletter. Um, I don't produce them regularly, but from time to time when I feel I have something to say, I send it out to people just to kind of keep them updated with interesting topics and things to think about. Um, and then I've also got my book. This was a neat trick that I learned at one of my cryptocurrency conferences. Um, if you have a phone and you hold it up to the QR code, basically that will take you directly to um, the page on Amazon where my book is for sale, if you're interested in that. Um, and if you do decide to get it, um, if you write me a review, of, especially if it's going to be a nice review, I would be eternally grateful. So thank you very much. But that's pretty much what all I have to say for today. So thank you for your attention. I've got no idea if you're still listening to me. I hope you are. Um, but it's time for questions. So there we go. I will stop presenting. Is anyone still there? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Victoria. Thank Hello. you for your presentation. Yeah. Um, it has a lot of valuable uh, insight. Uh, and I have a question for you. Like, you said Elon Musk is uh, one of the um, people who are for Bitcoin, yeah, and he intend to hold Bitcoin, the balance sheet of Tesla, mm -hmm. and uh, they will not uh, convert that into cars. But uh, recently, I uh, I read the news that Elon Musk uh, sell ten percent of Bitcoin that Tesla hold, mm -hmm. and uh, do you, do you see that the action is like a bump in dump action, and uh, it's just like um, I've been charged a Bitcoin. Um, I I do know about that. I think um, because it's, because holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet is a relatively new thing for them. I think uh, they had to convince the board that actually it was a liquid asset. Um, they needed to know that they could you know recover their funds quickly if they needed to. So some people are saying that it was just a test, and you know so Michael Saylor has gone all in on converting his balance sheet to cash but Elon Musk is a little bit behind him um, and obviously they have certain obligations to fulfill by operating as a company and I think their board of directors needed to see that actually they could recover that Bitcoin if they needed to 
and I think Elon, I think I believe Elon tweeted about that, and he confirmed that that test had been successful. So it remains to be seen. It may well be in the next quarter that that money has been reinvested. It's it's difficult to say. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. And now the second question. Um, I was concerned about um, you say Bitcoin a protection against inflation, but what about the volatility of Bitcoin price? Uh, that almost uh, treat some treat, and then the price of Bitcoin like go up and down, uh, with the huge range. So, uh, is it really? Um, to for protecting uh, the inflation. Yeah, so um, it's a tricky one. It, it um, in the time that I had available, it was difficult to go into that in more detail. Um, but on so one of the things, and I go into more detail about this in in the book that I wrote. So one of the things I noticed when I was offering Bitcoin as a payment method is that even though I was offering it, not many people were actually using that. Because actually, once most people understood that Bitcoin was a store of value, they, they wanted to hold on to it. They didn't actually want to spend it. And also, there were costs involved in kind of buying it and selling it. Um, so, um, you know, if you're a business and you're aware of that, what you can do, you obviously, it is a tricky thing to manage. But the thing is, Bitcoin still only... 10 years old and as time goes by that volatility will become less it was particularly volatile in the early days because no one really understood what it was or if it would work but as time goes by and I think now because it's been around for 10 years and you know the actual bitcoin protocol hasn't broken at all in 10 years so people are developing more and more confidence in it and as they become more confident in it and the network grows, although there are short term fluctuations in price, and I admit within a short period of time, those moves can be very dramatic. But like I said with the Pi example, you know, if you want something, if you want, if you want to save for something that you know you're going to have to pay for in five years time um, and you want somewhere to store it safely. Yes, fair enough. Um, if you wanted something that you wanted to spend the money on tomorrow, then maybe cash would be a better solution. But if you want something that's more long term um, and five years is a good example, because with Bitcoin, with the four and a half year price cycles, although um, you have these huge trajectories, normally when they come back down, it doesn't come back lower than the previous high. And so over a long enough time cycle, that volatility actually eases out. So at the moment, that's why they talk about Bitcoin as being a store of value, because over a longer term time horizon, it definitely protects you from inflation. I, I agree that short term, it's more volatile, so you need to be more cautious. But as the network grows, um, there are ways around that until it becomes um, until it becomes more stable. But it wouldn't have value as a, it wouldn't have value as a store of value unless it was possible for it to be used as a means of exchange because you're storing it so that you can exchange it in the future. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Anyone else? Um, yes. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very intriguing um, presentation. Oh, yeah. Um, nice. that, yeah. I, I just want to ask quickly, what, what uh, I know you didn't mention any alternate current, uh, cu uh, cu currencies, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, what are your opinions about altcoins in general? Well, I think altcoins are very interesting and I think it's symptomatic of the fact that, you know, Bitcoin is such a new technology. I mean, if we go back to um, the Murray Rothbard quote where it's talking about the fact that it's, a, you know, it's a cumulative development in a means of exchange, you know, just because something seems like a good means of exchange now doesn't necessarily mean it will be in the future. Things tend to develop as a good form of money because they prove its worth over time. So I think in the very early days of um, Bitcoin, it was it was difficult to really establish that. But as Bitcoin becomes more more established, it becomes more valuable because ultimately, you know, a lot of these altcoins, even though Bitcoin is unique, all of that software can still be duplicated. And that's where a lot of these altcoins have come from. You know, so you've got Bitcoin Cash, which was originally Bitcoin, but then just copied the protocol and then went off and did its same thing with it. Same with Litecoin, same with Digibyte. Um, so all of them are kind of trying the same experiment with different ideas. And, you know, that's the benefit of the free market. You know, you've kind of got this melting pot of different ideas and different projects. 
Um, people see the weaknesses in Bitcoin, like like the fact that it takes a long time to confirm a payment and stuff like that. And so they want to kind of go off and kind of create their own version of it, thinking that maybe it will be better. And all of these projects have value because just in the process of experimenting with them, anyone who's working on developing Bitcoin can maybe use some of those ideas and incorporate them as part of the Bitcoin protocol. But ultimately, the winner will be the one with the best reputation. And right now, Bitcoin is the one who's winning the argument. So I think, you know, if you're a trader, you can certainly, you know, make makes get some advantages from trading the altcoins a little bit like trying to trade currencies in the traditional financial market because you know our our grounding for sound stable money was lost over a hundred years ago and there's hardly anyone alive today who remembers what that was like and so at the moment we're in this huge melting pot of ideas but history demonstrates that you know what's best for society is if you have one form of money that's stable that everyone understands as a form of, of money that's stable. You know, history has shown that even when they had gold and silver as money, just the change in the ratios between gold and silver could be quite um, disruptive in society. So I think all of the altcoins are just symptomatic of where we are right now in history. But I think ultimately, um, you know, for society to be stable, it's going to need to gravitate towards one. And so it's a popularity contest. Um, so, you know, I think I wouldn't dismiss the altcoins at all. I think there's so certainly something to be gained from trading them. I think there's certainly something to be gained from the fact that they exist at all because they come up with interesting ideas. But ultimately, there will be one winner. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a gamble as to which one it will be. But Bitcoin's winning the war, which is why I think some of these um, powerful people are starting to get on board. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Great. Anyone else? Talk to me, someone. <laughs> Ah, oh, a face. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Anyone else has got final questions for Victoria? Oh, I had a question that was kind of, I think my, my Aki um, kind of got there for me. It was to do with your view on uh, alternative coins. Right. Okay. Um, right. Um, I think if there are no questions, then um, we'll say a very big thank you to Victoria. Um, uh, obviously, if you've got um, more questions, you can go to her website and you know you can leave her some questions and um, she'll get back to you, I'm sure. Um, otherwise, if you've got more questions, you can send them to me. I can forward them on to Victoria as well. So, um, yeah. So, um, I don't know. Um, how do you do a hand of applause? You know? Oh. <laughs> You know, I mean, um, across um, virtual space, you know, but um, yeah, so thank you so much, Victoria, for taking your time out, you know, precious time out to share your experience and your knowledge in, in the area. All right. That. Okay, All right. excellent. Cool. All right, I'll, let, I'll leave you to it then. Yeah, thanks very much, Victoria. Okay, bye. Yeah.